All right, how's everybody feeling about today, tonight, everything? Good. All right, so uh, if you're not familiar with uh, what CoreOS does, we build a lot of open source technologies, introduce etcd, the primary key value store of Kubernetes, a bunch of other things like CoreOS Linux, et cetera, over the last few years. Um, you also may have seen this from one of my other three talks today. So um, if this seems familiar, it's not deja vu. You're not tired of the election cycle. It's actually because this has happened before. Um, and then we also have a number of products like Tectonic, which uses pure upstream Kubernetes and builds a bunch of enterprise integrations around, uh, around that uh, core component. And then Quay, which is a hosted service for building containers and, and uh, hosting containers. And also can be ran behind the firewall. So that's what CoreOS does. I'm the CTO and co-founder. Um, but let's dive into what I want to talk about today, which is the state of automatic updates and the state of bringing Kubernetes and managing Kubernetes across any sort of infrastructure. So the story begins uh, that we're going to be talking about with uh, two vulnerabilities that were released on October 20th, so just a few weeks ago. Um, the first is Dirty Cow. All of our vulnerabilities today have to have a logo. It has to be really cool, kind of a catchy name. It's just the rules of the game and security today. And so uh, with Dirty Cow, uh, what had happened was <clears throat> security vulnerability came out. It was disclosed. Really bad one. Essentially, it allows you, given local, root, local file system access, to gain root, um, bypassing essentially all of the security and uh, all the security properties that the Linux kernel is supposed to enforce for you. Now, the unique thing here is that within 24 hours, the majority of the hosts running CoreOS Linux, which is a piece of software that we release as open source, that a lot of people use as the underlying operating system for their Kubernetes clusters, et cetera, uh, we are able to patch a majority of those systems within 24 hours. And it's because of the mechanisms and the, the automated updates that we have. Now, on that same day, a vulnerability was disclosed publicly about uh, Kubernetes client cert validation failure. And this vulnerability was pretty bad. And it, we kind of didn't handle the security disclosure process perfectly. But we're learning. We're a younger community. And we'll work it out. We have a lot of really smart folks that are going to nail that down. The really disappointing thing, though, was we were sort of powerless to actually do anything about it. Uh, the issue came out. There was a patch available. But then all of us had to essentially manually figure out what to do next. Some of us have deployed Kubernetes in one way or another. We laid it down with configuration management. We used this tool that we found on GitHub one day because that seemed to have a lot of stars then. Um, there's just a lot of different ways that we're doing it. And so it was a manual upgrade, and I think we can do better. And of course, uh, Kubernetes is a young community, and so we don't have all the panache and branding of all these vulnerabilities. So I'm going to label this one. It's going to be called Mask. Okay, just for the purposes of this talk, um, we love Ks, so I'll up, uppercase that. So it's masked with a cool big K. Um, but there's an opportunity here. There's an opportunity for automation. So with CoreOS Linux, how did we actually get to upgrading these things, a majority of our hosts in 24 hours? It's because CoreOS takes inspiration from a lot of the things that we know to be correct. We know that you want to do rolling upgrades. We know that you want to have atomic upgrades that you can roll back from. So CoreOS Linux builds that into the core. So we're able to apply an update uh, from a running system. We have an A copy of the operating system and a B copy. We apply an update. We reboot the system, and it moves forward. This all feels very familiar to us in the Kubernetes community with deployments. So you have a copy of your application that's running today. It's behind your load balancer. You get a new version of your application. You want to roll that. You update the deployment. And boom, everything is, is moved forward. Perhaps you had a vulnerability in your software that you were patching. Now this brings us to the concept of self-hosting. So what if we were able to take all those primitives that we had inside of Kubernetes to manage our applications in this very reasonable way that we know to be a very uh, resilient way of, of deploying and managing apps. Well, we, what if we brought that to Kubernetes itself? So if you're not familiar with this idea of self-hosting, um, it's pretty straightforward. So compiler writers. Compiler writers want to use the language that they're uh, building in order to write their compiler. 
So in the case of GCC, you input C source code, out pops a new copy of GCC. Uh, Go, Go, the language that Kubernetes uses, recently became self-hosted. So you input Go code uh, into a Go compiler and out pops a new version of Go. This gets a little bit noodly when you start to think about actual things running processes. So let's go a practical example. Here's young Linus Torvalds. Isn't he adorable? Uh, young Linus didn't have Linux yet. So how's he going to do his development? He was using an operating system called Minix. He built the Linux source uh, and out popped a cute little penguin called Tex, the Linux kernel, um, when, when compiling that. And then a few months later, but I'll use a much older photo, a few months later, Linus has learned his lessons. He finally has figured out how to get this kernel booted. So now he has the opportunity to bring all the compilers and everything that he needs in order to do local development. So he's able to use Linux to build Linux, to then boot Linux. That's what self-hosting is about. And this is a concept that we've been kind of striving for inside of Kubernetes and as a community for a while. Uh, Brian Grant, one of the co-founders of the project, said that running all of our components inside of pods, all the components being the scheduler and the API, et cetera, would help us avoid implementing more brittle and less portable solutions. So eventual, eventually, we'll get around to self-hosting. This was about 20 months ago when this comment was made on one of the public GitHub issues. I'm sure Brian has the GitHub number me memorized. Um, if any of you talk to Brian, he like memorizes the GitHub numbers. It's amazing. Uh, human indexing. So the, the idea here is that we take uh, Kubernetes, we take a deployment, we have a new API server, maybe an API server that lacks the mask vulnerability. Um, we're able to tell Kubernetes, deploy me a new copy of the Kubernetes API server, and we roll forward. Now, today's world looks a lot different than this. It, we're not using self-hosted everywhere. What we're doing is we're using all these different installation tools. These installation tools talk to our cloud provider and then bring Kubernetes on top. Uh, so every single one of these installation tools kind of lays files out differently. We put manifests in different places. We write out the kubelet init system differently. And so every single one of these tools needs to write a different operational uh, manual. And so you use that exact same tool when you need to move between versions. And here's the better way that we're proposing with self-hosted um, and that SIG cluster lifecycle has been working really hard towards. You use the infrastructure tools to deploy infrastructure. So when you need compute network or storage, you go to your infrastructure tool that knows how to talk to your cloud provider. And then you use Kubernetes to deploy Kubernetes. You use kubectl to up update the deployment of the API server. And the advantage that we have here is that the exact same abstractions, the exact same runbooks, the exact same documentation works whether you're running on AWS, whether you're running on Azure, whether you're maybe bringing this on to bare metal and you want to move from a copy of Kubernetes that is vulnerable or has a bug that you want to have fixed to a copy of Kubernetes that is fixed. So the goals, create a foundation to aut automatic cluster upgrades or at least automate them. Use the Kubernetes compute network and storage abstractions and let the infrastructure tools focus on the infrastructure. So what I want to show you today is what uh, we've been kind of calling self-driving Kubernetes. Um, and it's a technical preview. This is all live, hopefully. Uh, we've had three demos go well, so the odds are not in my favor. Um, but what we'll be doing is we'll be going into a Kubernetes cluster that is self-hosted and doing an uh, automated update. So what I've done is I've used, um, I've used the Tectonic installer tool, which is built on top of the Kubernetes incubator project called BootCube. BootCube is a temporary API control plane. So what it does is it includes in a single binary etcd, the API server, the scheduler, the controller manager. This is essentially the little seed that you plant inside of the cluster in order to bring up a full self-hosted cluster. It's the Minix in our analogy with Linus. So once you deploy this, uh, you get a working Kubernetes cluster. And if we look through the actual um, look through the, the dashboard, what we can see if we start to search around for Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes components that we're familiar with, we see that uh, there's a Kubernetes scheduler in here. We can see that um, I've done the correct thing and I've scaled up to two pods. You know, maybe I want to uh, scale that up to three pods because I want to have a more highly available 
um, API service. These are the sorts of functionality that we enable when we use the Kubernetes APIs. We can easily create HA and scalable structures that are able to recover. And similarly, we can come in and see that there's an API server that's running as a daemon set. And this is technical details around how networking works inside of Kubernetes, the reason why it's not a deployment, um, which I'll, I'll, I won't go into here. But the big thing is you dig through these components and we see that um, they're running version 1.4.3. Let's pretend for a second that it's actually 1.4.2 with the mask vulnerability. Um, and what we want to do is upgrade to the latest release of Kubernetes, which is Kubernetes 1.4.5. And of course, um, as any, any good Kubernetes demo, what I've done is I have a very sophisticated Nginx default page running on this cluster. Uh, I'm just kidding. So we have a default page that we're going to use as our example application. And this example application will continue to stay up, and we'll be using uh, AWS CloudWatch to show that the application isn't losing availability while we do this upgrade. All right, so I'll show you the UX for all this. To do the update, it's really sophisticated. What you'll want to do is come in here and click this button. Uh, what that'll do is, in the background, we have a piece of software that is looking at the third-party resources um, where we now describe, I want to move this cluster from version 1.4.3 to 1.4.5, and it will begin the process of rolling through and updating all these different components. So we can start to test that out by coming in. <clears throat> we can start, start to test this out by coming in and looking through the different, of course. Um, perfect. <laughs> Luck of the draw, right? Um, <laughs> All right, so we'll try this one more time. Uh, so we'll come in and we'll uh, actually start to upgrade the, the cluster. And so these third-party resources will um, describe, and there's an active component living inside the cluster that is going to be um, actually going through and doing the deployment on our behalf. So if we come in and look at something like, say, the daemon sets, what you'll see is that the daemon set that is running the API server um, will be terminating, and then in a few moments after it finishes terminating, a new version of the API server will come up, um, replacing the previous one. Great. So my original cluster decided to come back for a second. Um, and so what will happen over this entire process is that the Kubernetes cluster will um, roll through, upgrade all the components, and will finally end up in a state where uh, Kubernetes, once the ELB settles out, um, will continue to roll forward to a settled state where the kubelet all the way to the API server is fully upgraded. Okay. So I got logged out during that little uh, ELB kerfuffle. So if we dive into the daemon sets that are running on top of the um, kube system, what we should see here in a second is that uh, the the latest version of the daemon set for the API server is rolled out, version v145. And this will continue to happen through the other components, such as the controller manager, the scheduler, until we finally end up on a cluster that um, has fully been updated. And at the end of that, this page will say, status complete, cluster upgraded. Now, during that process, um, what we should notice is that uh, even though for a second there I lost my console, probably because the ELB lost health checking on the console. The actual thing that we care about is our application. The application never went down. And similarly, we, the nice thing about having the ability to use Kubernetes APIs is at worst we could have logged into the systems that had been running those daemon sets, even though they weren't at the ELBs, and started to debug the system, figured out, well, what is it the scheduler that went down? Is it the console that went down? Is it the service that went down? So it creates really, really consistent uh, really, really consistent debugging and, uh, and management uh, user experiences, which is important as we start to think about operators having to manage Kubernetes clusters across different clouds, across different um, environments. Okay, so how is this all working? So like I said, there's this third-party resource that when I click that button, it essentially describes between the current version of Kubernetes and the desired version, and the this piece of software talking to the Kubernetes APIs 
um, not doing any configuration management, not SSHing into the host, not touching his files on disk, will actually update all those components. And there's a, a few parts to make this happen. There is a part where we look at the desired state that the user has described and in the current state. We analyze that difference and we figure out uh, should the API server be upgraded, should the controller manager be upgraded, and we essentially create a plan to go through and upgrade the system. And then at the very end, we'll actually notify the user, hey, we got to a fully upgraded Kubernetes cluster, um, and we, we tell them you're now running the latest, greatest Kubernetes. And this is all done via Kubernetes APIs. So what this is is a self-hosted cluster launched via BootCube. Um, it's upgraded via Kubernetes APIs and an operator that looks at the desired state described by a user. And it's automated by a single button or can be put into a fully automatic mode where um, a user essentially subscribes to a channel. So we see that the update of the cluster that I originally had clicked the button on um, has said the update is fully complete. Um, and you can subscribe to various channels like say alpha, beta, or stable. Um, and move between strategies like uh, admin approval or automatic updates. So next steps. BootCube, the underlying tool that deployed this onto AWS, works on GCP and on bare metal. Uh, please use BootCube. It's a Kubernetes incubator project, and a lot of the innovation that actually makes this type of infrastructure possible um, this type of self-hosted infrastructure possible um, is in there. You can find a lot of docs and deployment guides. Um, tomorrow, uh, Aaron Levy from our team at CoreOS is going to be giving a talk called Kubeception, um, going into more detail about how this is all possible and some of the lessons learned from making, uh, making the system work in the way that it does. And then finally, uh, I have to thank everyone inside of SIG Cluster Lifecycle who over the last few months um, have really helped us take this concept um, that we've all kind of talked about in the Kubernetes community for a long time from concept to prototype to really a uh, implementation that is, um, is really easy and really uh, tolerant to failure for user users to try out and use. Um, and finally, like, I think that uh, we're at a point in the adoption of Kubernetes where we need to be discussing what is it that we want to see out of the operational model of this system. Um, installation is one side of the problem, but if we don't tackle management early enough in this community, uh, we will end up in the spot where when this mask vulnerability or the next vulnerability comes out, uh, we're unable to act in a way that is appropriate to be responsible to our infrastructure, to our applications, and to eventually to our users. Um, so, uh, well, what I want to do is I want to uh, be able to handle these things, like this mass vulnerability. I want to secure Kubernetes, and I want to even secure Kubernetes and ensure that it can deal with whatever comes. Thank you so much for your attention. If, uh, And uh, just make one final plea, if any of you guys want to learn more about this stuff, uh, come visit our booth um, inside the pavilion there. Thanks so much for your attention. Thanks. <laughs>